because the, the cost of nuclear, most of it is in the finance of the money that you have to borrow rather than the absolute cost of the reactors themselves. So if we're not careful, we'll just get left behind and we'll be back of everybody's supply chain again. You said in your lecture that most of our nuclear power plants by the end of this decade will have been retired. Hello and welcome to a brand new podcast from Gresham College. My name is Richard Tavener and I'm your host of Any Further Questions. This is a podcast where we invite one of our speakers on to go a little bit further on one of their recent talks. Today, I'm joined by Dame Sue Iron. Sue, welcome. How are you? Very well, thank you, Richard. And thank you for having me on the, uh, the podcast. Dame Sue is currently Honorary President of the National Skills Academy for Nuclear and is a member of the UK Nuclear Regulators Independent Advisory Panel. She's an engineer by trade and has spent over three decades in the nuclear sector. What is the role of nuclear power in a net zero system? Sue, can I ask, what inspired you to write this lecture and what were you trying to convey to our Gresham audience? I guess what I was trying to convey was uh, the uh, the challenge of trying to get to, to net zero whilst uh, still being able to supply the uh, power that's needed to um, enable a 21st century industrialised society to function. So it was important to me that we perhaps address some of the, the myths and uh, non-facts that are often fired at, uh, at nuclear energy in particular, and to set it in the context of uh, the benefits that it can bring uh, to getting to, uh, to net zero, which is, is so important for us in these days of, uh, of climate uh, challenge. I also wanted to perhaps make a, a lay audience more aware of the, um, the benefits of nuclear energy compared with, uh, with other low carbon energy sources, because uh, you know, quite often uh, people don't realize just how uh, low carbon nuclear is. You know, it's got the lowest life cycle carbon intensity of any of the electricity generating technologies. It's got the lowest life cycle land, land use, and it's actually got the lowest impact on ecosystems. So I just wanted to set it in the context of it is a really good, reliable source of low carbon energy, and we desperately need it in the 21st century if we're to have any hope of getting to, uh, to net zero. Now, many people obviously are aware of nuclear energy, but I wondered whether it would be useful to have a brief overview of how nuclear energy is produced. Uh, well, nuclear energy uh, is produced by, um, uh, there's two sorts, there's uh, uh, what's called fission nuclear energy. That's where heavy atoms in the periodic table are split. And as the atoms split, like uranium or, or plutonium uh, as examples, they form lower atomic number isotopes and in the process uh, release a lot of energy. And the second sort is fusion energy, which is the, the opposite. It's where you fuse together uh, light elements in much the same way as the sun does. The more common one is, of course, fission energy, which has been around for over 60, 70 years, whereas fusion energy has yet to realise the um, engineering development that's required to uh, enable it to be deployed to generate electricity uh, realistically. So in a, in a fission reactor, which is the ones that we have today, basically you, you put um, uranium, usually, pellets or metal, um, into um, a tube, a clad, that is placed in a particular geometry inside a reactor core, which is cooled either with gas, like our historic systems, or with, uh, with water. So as the uranium fissions, when neutrons uh, hit it, it generates a lot of, uh, of energy, and that energy is translated into heat, and either the gas or the water that surrounds the, uh, the fuel elements uh, conveys the heat to uh, steam turbines. Nuclear reactors work um, either like pressure cookers or uh, kettles in the way in which they, uh, they generate heat. When did we first start seeing nuclear energy being produced in the UK? In the UK, in terms of production of electricity, it would be in the early 1950s when Calder Hall, which is the uh, first set of reactors in the United Kingdom, um, were connected to the grid back in 1954. We had a lot of questions that came in after you gave your lecture online. I wanted to start with one that addressed energy security. Could it be now that energy security is a larger driver globally than reducing emissions? And I think the questioner framed this in the context of Ukraine. Well, I think certainly the uh, the war in Ukraine woke people up to the fragility of geopolitics, I guess, and the fact that... Um, if you didn't have the prime sources of energy under your direct control, then you were left vulnerable to geopolitical forces, whether that be Russia and its supply of uh, of gas to uh, 
particularly Western Europe, but also the um, uh, the Middle East, which is not always wholly stable, which again is a, a large supplier of LNG gas. So geopolitics certainly played a, a part, and people became aware that if you if you didn't have it on your own soil, then you were left vulnerable. And of course, the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine uh, 24 hours a day. So a, a low carbon source of alternative power um, was more at the top of people's uh, minds. So yeah, I think certainly energy security added to the uh, th- to the debate. Another question on energy security. I believe that states can find a more urgent justification for public-private financing. They said that climate change is still too far away for many governments outside the EU. What do you think? Uh, I think there's certainly an element in, of truth in that, although when we look to this week particularly, where there's been extreme heat in, in Europe, across uh, Spain, um, southern Italy, Greece particularly, then people realise that extreme climate events do have a a source, and that is the challenge to the overall climate as a result of the CO2 that uh, that humans have emitted. So people do understand that. But I agree that short term, people are more worried about whether they've got uh, power down their plugs or able to power their central heating than they are about um, you know climate change that may not come to real, um, real, um, you know, realization um, in their lifetime, but then you you see even in the UK extreme floods um, that are linked with uh, with climate change as well as heat waves. So people are aware. It's just that the the power down the wires twenty four hours a day is actually an immediate issue as opposed to an issue that may be slightly longer term or maybe not affect you if you don't live in a flood risk area. In your lecture, you showed us a table that showed the UK currently sits 10th in the table of countries with the most reactors. Could we have more? And why don't we have more? Certainly, we we could have more. And the the desire of current government and indeed um, the the current opposition is to try and get us what they've declared as 24 gigawatts as uh, as an urgent mission. But um, they would be of the water-cooled type rather than the gas-cooled type that we historically had. You asked again, why didn't we have more? Well, I guess back in the late 1990s, government at the time thought that we could do without nuclear energy, that, you know, we could do everything with wind and solar. And it's taken them a while to realise that that's just not possible. And that if they're serious about um, energy security for the UK, then you need something that's going to generate large baseload electricity or rather firm power electricity, as well as the intermittent sources that come from um, from the very good wind that we have and uh, potentially solar as well. So it's a question of government policy. We basically lost 20 years in terms of our ability to look to replace our our current fleet. So in your lecture, you mentioned other countries get their nuclear energy from neighbouring countries and they don't actually have any power plants within their borders. Is this something the UK could adopt? Does being an island make this impossible? It wouldn't make it totally impossible. It would make it somewhat challenging because we only have modest links with um, the... uh, rest of Europe with the cables that uh, that currently exist. So at the moment, we only have a, a cable between ourselves and France that will give us the equivalent of the old Tizewell reactor. We've only got a two, two gigawatt link under the channel and a smaller one with the, uh, the Netherlands. So the links are not that great. So it would make it a lot more challenging for us than, say, Germany to take power from France or Denmark to take power from Sweden, where the European grid is much better linked than uh, than our our links with uh, Europe. So theoretically, could we develop a link with Norway, Iceland, with other countries that neighbour us that are close by to us, or would the cost be too astronomical to to even justify well, it? Well, links are are being developed um, anyway in order to pick up uh, and transmit wind. Okay. Um, so links between ourselves and uh, and Norway, links between ourselves and uh, and mainland Europe to enable it, it to be much easier to trade uh, excess wind capacity, which we would have because uh, we have we're probably better than anybody else in terms of potential for wind generation. And so movement of wind generation it doesn't really matter what what the source is, whether it's wind or 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 nuclear, you'd you'd still be able to trade it. So it, possible, but um, the bottom line is we need a lot of stable power, particularly as we look to decarbonize our transport sector. Uh, you know, transport is, you know, of the order of 30% of our energy demand. And so 
Uh, electricity at the moment is only a, a minor part of our carbon emission problem. You know, you're only talking about 25 plus per, uh, percent. So that's not where the big challenge is. It's in decarbonizing the transport sector, which means you up the amount of electricity you, you need, probably double, maybe even as high as treble what we currently envisage. So it's a supply and demand problem. We are demanding more of this type of electricity, but the supply just isn't there. Time is of the essence, it sounds like. Is politics getting in the way of things and is politics slowing things down in your opinion money rather than politics i think is what uh, is slowing things down because i don't think any of the main political parties at the moment have any particular objection to nuclear it's just to, trying to figure out how to get the money to build it but i mean it's not just nuclear that uh, um, suffers from that as well it's the large offshore wind farms investment generally needs stable government policy and then it doesn't matter what color the government is it needs stable policy and a commitment to a certain amount over decades so that you don't get these flip-flops of policy and investors have confidence that they'll get a good return on their investment. So is the government, in your opinion, doing a good job or could they be doing more? And how important is their role within working in a net zero climate? Well, I mean, aspirationally, they're um, they're giving the right messages. It's just that it's not followed up by the necessary things that would follow um, a policy aspiration. So there's no doubt that when you build um, new nuclear systems, you actually need to have have got one, if not two, away with confidence so that the private sector can then flow in behind and have confidence that they can be built on time to to schedule. So government has a role to play in, if you like, establishing the, the the baseline and in helping to uh, to finance that, at least initially. I mean, given the potential of nuclear energy, I mean, they'd get their money back ultimately anyway, but it's important that they actually step up to the plate initially because every other government is doing, you know, it's the United States, very large scale in uh, assist to uh, the nuclear sector, almost all the European countries, both in terms of policy and money to uh, get their uh, systems either either um, replaced or new ones c- uh, completely built. They've all got government um, input and help. It's just that ours, the, the amount that uh, ours is uh, is offering just um, isn't adequate. You said in your lecture that most of our nuclear power plants by the end of this decade will have been retired. And something that the government are doing uh, it, to try and counteract that is they're building new ones. Could you talk to us a bit about Hinkley Point C? Uh, well, Hink- Hinkley Point C uh, was one of the what what was called Generation Three Plus de- designs. So one of the more modern designs of light water reactor. There were others, such as the American AP1000 or the Japanese American boiling water uh, reactor, advanced boiling water reactor. But um, Hinkley Point C is the largest of the types that could have been built, and it's an older design. And it's mainly what we would call in the sector uh, stick build. Most of the construction take place at site. And as can be seen by the journey that Hinkley has been on, it's a it's a complex construction project and it suffered uh, as a result of that in the same way as the same project in France and the project in, in Finland. Some of the other competing designs uh, are more modular and potentially could have been built faster. I mean, that's why there's been a focus recently on small modular reactors, because the concept is that uh, much of it can be built in factory away from the site, and even the concrete modules are built separately as modules and then shipped to site. So there is much less on-site work and you can build them a lot faster because the the cost of nuclear most of it is in the finance of the money that you have to borrow rather than the absolute cost of the reactors themselves the the the, the bit that creates the uh the heat the nuclear the nuclear bit is only 15 ish percent of the actual cost of the reactor the rest of it is in the concrete etc that goes around it hinkley point was borrowed at nine percent and not at two percent which was the government rate should governments be obliged to lend at two percent well governments elsewhere in the world managed to do that so um there's no reason why ours couldn't if it uh, if it chose to but um hinkley was borrowed on, uh, on the private m- marketplace not with government our government didn't lend the money. The money was put up by France and uh, and China. What the government agreed to do was to give them a contract, what's called a contract for difference, that set the price that they would be given for the energy as the reactor started to generate. You mentioned that Hinkley Point C is a light water reactor. Is that is that what you said? Could you explain a bit about what what that means and how that differs for the different types of nuclear power plants? Well, the power plants that we had in the UK historically were gas cooled reactors. The older generation were called Magnox reactors. They were cooled with carbon dioxide. 
and our currently operating reactors are advanced gas cooled reactors, uh, slightly different fuel design, but um, uh, and materials, but the uh, coolant gas is still carbon dioxide. Light water reactors um, were adopted worldwide as the standard. They were based on uh, two American companies, Westinghouse and General Electric, who supplied uh, re uh, reactors uh, globally or the designs globally, which were then taken up by um, indigenous uh, companies uh, in Japan, in Korea, in France, uh, um, to name but uh, but three. Hinkley Point is a, a reactor that is supplied by uh, France, by uh, <clears throat> EDF and its partners, and it is uh, cooled with uh, water, normal water. Uh, the reason why we call it light water is because there are some reactors globally that were designed in Canada um, and supplied globally, which use what's called heavy water. So they, they use uh, water that has a, a heavier form of hydrogen in the, uh, in the coolant water. So most, most reactors are cooled by um, what's called light water. It's just normal water as you and I would understand it. And could you tell me a bit about small modular reactors, SMRs, what they are and what the future is for them? Small modular reactors, I mean, they, they vary. Some are very small, almost micro reactors. Again, uh, many are water cooled. Not all are water cooled, but many are, are water cooled. And uh, they're just smaller versions of the, of the large ones that we have grown up around the world. So the, the uh, advantages of them are that they are modular in construction. So it means that you can construct um, pretty much everything in factory before it goes to, uh, to site. Um, therefore, there's a lot less work on site, so greater quality control, uh, build 24 hours a day, seven days a week, um, no vagaries of the uh, of the weather. So um, they are faster to build and hence cheaper because you borrow the money over a much shorter time period before you, you get your returns. But they are very different in size. New Scale, the company in America, um, their units are 50 megawatts or slightly, just slightly more than 50 megawatts supplied in blocks of uh, six or, or, or 12. Uh, Rolls-Royce is around about 480 megawatts. So it's a bigger, small modular reactor. So it really depends whose design you're buying. Um, and that really depends on, you know, what are the what are the, is the best one for you to have in terms of what does the grid want in your particular area? Uh, how much flexibility grid wise do you want? But concept wise, they're, they're pretty much the same. They use the same sort of fuel and uh, they use the same sort of uh, containment. We had two questions on SMRs from our online audience. Can Rolls-Royce ma manufacture SMRs for the UK by when and at what cost? Yes, they could. Um, and um, Rolls-Royce uh, have been on record as saying that, you know, if we started now or a bit earlier, then they could actually have a reactor that would be generating round about uh, 20, 2030. But you'd need to, to start now. Their reactor design is currently going through the final stages of assessment by the UK's uh, regulator. OK, so it is a strong possibility that it's this a strong could possibility. Yeah. I mean, there are other Great. designs as well where um, companies have approached uh, the UK to potentially put their designs into uh, regulatory assessment as well. It may well be a Rolls-Royce design or it could be one of the other internationally uh, available designs that are being deployed elsewhere in the world. And from what you said in the lecture, most of our power plants will be retired by 2030. So it sounds like this would be a great time for Rolls-Royce to pick up the baton, as it were, and carry on. It would, it would. Following, following 2030. Another question about SMRs. Would the SMRs be grouped to keep nuclear power in select locations or installed, for example, on or near the sites of existing closing coal and gas power stations to provide more local energy? What public response do you expect? Certainly for the, uh, the first deployments, you would see um, clusters of uh, small modular reactors deployed on existing sites. Uh, just because the, there is the public confidence um, in those local areas that uh, um, would welcome that sort of um, in investment. It's p potentially possible that they could be deployed on, on other sites. I mean, we have a very good grid across the UK, so use of old coal sites you know, wouldn't be out of the question, but they'd certainly um, be deployed on existing reactor sites. And that, that's what the policy uh, that's gone through Parliament historically has, uh, has said. It's identified where new, new nuclear power plants can be built. And currently that's on existing nuclear sites. So there's lots of potential here for lots of new schemes to happen in the future. In your opinion, what would you think the best path for the UK would be to take to maximise the potential for us to reach these net zero goals? 
well, certainly the, um, the 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 best route forward would be to find a way to encourage the investment either by assistance, as in financial assistance, or or policy confidence that would enable companies like, for example, Rolls Royce, General Electric, or others to deploy their their small modular reactors in the in the UK. I think also we still would welcome you know more than one new. Um, gigawatt size reactor. That's the sort of size of size well C, Hinkley Point C. So large and small, but just because of the amount that we actually need to to get built by uh, 2050. But I would also encourage much greater investment in uh, some of the more advanced um, modular reactors, which are not water cooled. They're uh, high temperature gas reactors because they offer the opportunity to provide heat as well as electricity. So they're much better for linking with energy intensive industries like the steel industry, the glass industry or the petrochemical industry generally. And, uh, you know, there are discussions underway in in the UK about potential deployment of um, high temperature reactors for the purposes of heat and hydrogen production, as well as electricity production. But we need to get a wiggle on, you know, there's no point sitting talking about it. We actually need to do something now. I mean, the United States are already taking forward investment in high temperature reactors. The Dow Chemical Company is about to um, build several down at uh, one of their bigger sites in the United States. So if we're not careful, we'll just get left behind and we'll be back of everybody's supply chain again. As you mentioned in your lecture, the USA and France are pushing nuclear power and have made policy interventions to reflect this, so they're actually doing it rather than just talking about it and saying it. I mean, we, we've made you know policy statements and we have put funding um, on the table. It's just that it's tiny compared to everybody else's. We had a question about government ownership. Should national grid and generators be brought back under government ownership? For example, the CEGB, which is the Central Electricity Generating Board. Um, well, it's certainly uh, an option. I mean, one of the reasons why the CEGB was privatised back in the you know, 1990s was because of the uh, desire by the government of the day to get competition into the, into the marketplace in order to keep costs down. The problem when you do that is that investment also tends to, uh, to go down. So costs go down for sure. Um, and there is competition. But the necessary investment in things like the grid and in new systems just doesn't get made because nobody is there's no no incentive to do that. So um, you know there may well be uh, some benefits um, in government ownership, but generally speaking, governments aren't very good owners of anything. The swings and roundabouts, you know, an element of government ownership might be helpful, but certainly you know long-term policy commitments and. Something that is uh, cross-party would be enormously helpful. I mean, at the end of the day, energy security is national security. If you if you lose your power, and you've got large cities like uh, you know London, Manchester, Birmingham without power, you know it doesn't take very long for society to collapse. Um, and so you know we could just do with a, a bit more cross-party common purpose, I think, in order to take the low carbon agenda forward. You mentioned earlier a few times this number 24 gigawatts of nuclear energy and we've had a few questions about that number where did that number come from and why is it that we have to reach um, that level uh, well it was thought it was a a reasonable proportion of the um of the the grid that would be would be running and it was thought that it was a reasonable target to aim for that could actually be built on the time scale for which it was envisaged so that's that's probably where the number came from. Do you believe that the UK lacks the full budget to reach 24 gigawatts of nuclear energy and thus must offer PPP finance structures to attract private capital to SMR projects? And he mentions the UK government offers incentives, not ownership. Not necessarily. The important thing is that you you get commitment for a small number to actually demonstrate that you can build them to the envisaged time and uh, and cost. And um, you know, once that happens, there are there's no shortage of international investors who will invest in nuclear energy, but it's just getting those those first you know two, three, four uh, away, um, so that um, investors can have confidence that uh, you know they're not going to be on a, a long journey with uh, with no return. So the future more EDF investment into the UK building EPRs is a note that I have here. EDF uh, have chosen the EPRs because it's a, a French-designed reactor. So, Sorry, can you just no- explain what EPR 
stands for? It stands for European Pressurized Water Reactor. And uh, it was a, a French design built by French companies. So um, that's why they chose, because EDF is owned by EDF in France, hmm. Electricity de France. That's what it stands for. But that design was chosen without competition because they they're, were a private company as far as the UK is concerned, although, of course, they're owned by the French government, largely. Has the landscape changed since you gave the lecture back in April and what's happened since then? Yeah, there's been a, a massive upshirt surge in international um, interest. So, you know, countries that hitherto um, were more cautious about nuclear energy and whether to refresh their fleets have done a, a complete vault fast and have passed um, a law through their, their respective parliaments. So Sweden is, is now on a journey to uh, replace their reactors. Uh, countries like Poland have already struck contracts, Hungary. So many countries in Europe have already decided to mobilize and have struck contracts in order to enable them to do that. You know, so we're, we're behind um, and falling further behind every week that passes by because of the delays that we've uh, we've introduced. They've just gone ahead and struck contracts. You know, I'm not just an advocate for nuclear energy. I'm a, an advocate for low carbon energy. And what we need is nuclear energy as part of that balanced portfolio of low carbon sources. The other two principal ones being um, wind and uh, and solar. Stu, thank you very much for joining me. I implore anyone listening to this to watch her lecture, which you can find on our Gresham website and on our YouTube channel. It's called What is the Role of Nuclear Power in a Net Zero System? Thank you very much, Sue, for joining me. Thank you. Thank you.